Welcome to the Lifestyle First podcast, discussing lifestyle medicine and making self-care as easy as one, two, three. One question, two research reviews, and three actionable health tips, all centered around the Lifestyle First method, your blueprint for the 10 key roots of optimal health and happiness. And now your host, lifestyle medicine physician and coach, Dr. Alka Patel. Hi, hey, and hello, hello, and welcome back to Series 11. This is Episode 3 of the Lifestyle First podcast. Now, the theme for today's show is food. And I just want to go back to my experience of food over the summer, when, as you'll know by now, I spent seven days in silence. And one thing that I that I noticed that the stillness allowed me to do was that it really allowed me to savor my food. It allowed me to, I guess, activate my pleasure senses, to allow my five senses to take over. And it allowed me to make eating a completely sensory experience. And I think what I found was that ability, that ability to simply eat mindfully, to eat with an awareness. What it meant was that I naturally ate slower. And I did this because I wanted to awaken my senses. So I wanted to allow my mouth to feel the textures of the food. And I was able to notice the smell of the watermelon and the color of the orange. And and I think it's important to remember as well that the slower you eat, the more you're, of course, chewing your food. It's that 20 chews per mouthful. It's always been a little mantra of mine. And when you're chewing slow and chewing more, it means that, of course, you're helping those digestive processes to, to get going, to get started. You're helping that enzyme amylase in your saliva to start breaking down your carbohydrates as well. And also the thing to remember about eating slower is the slower you eat, then the more awareness you have of your satiety signals. So remember, it takes 20 minutes from the signals from your stomach that say, I'm full to get to your brain to tell you to stop eating, which means that eating slower results in avoiding overeating. So there's an invitation for you then. I would love to invite you to make just one meal a day an explosive sensory experience for you. So I mean, no TV on in the background, no multitasking, no no chatter even or banter with your family when you're eating, just the pure indulgence in the pleasure of eating and letting your mind wander to the gratitude of the food on your plate. Because there's something else that happens when you allow yourself to enjoy the experience of eating. Because when I was, again, in the stillness of the mountains, what happened was that I I fell head over heels in love with an orange. <laughs> as crazy as it may sound, I was able to think about all the hands that this orange had been through to end up in my hands, the hands that tend the soil, the hands that watered the land, the hands that plucked the fruit. So this fruit could be with me with its beautiful, uplifting aroma packed with vitamin C and fiber and all that natural sweetness and sugar that it was giving me, giving me just what I needed. So today, today I wanted us to carry on talking about food and more specifically talking about sweetness and talking about sugar. So there are some myths that I want to debunk in today's show. And there's one question that um, that I do keep getting asked quite a lot, which relates to sugar. And what a lot of people say to me is, well, I seem to get a lot of cravings for sugar. I crave it. So how do I get rid of this? So that's the one question we're exploring today. How can I get rid of sugar cravings? And so to help answer that, I am delighted, absolutely delighted to welcome my guest today, who is Nagina Abdullah. Now, Nagina, she is the founder of Masala Body, and she loves to help career women to boost their metabolism, to lose weight and to live a healthy, sustainable lifestyle. And I know that when she's looked back at her own journey, she herself has lost 40 pounds 40 pounds, and she's been able to keep that off now for over 10 years. So I'm excited to have this conversation. Welcome, Nagina, looking gorgeous, of course. 
Hello, I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> Amazing. I'm going to tell people a little bit um, about you before we get going. So um, what do I know about you? Well, I know that you're the founder of Masala Body, and I know that you love helping career women to boost their metabolism and lose weight and live this very healthy, sustainable lifestyle. And of course, your own backstory is that you yourself has successfully lost how many pounds? Is it 40 pounds? And you've kept mm -hmm. that off for over 10 years. So um mm -hmm. Amazing, amazing. So really, really excited to have you here and to get into this conversation about sugar, right? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And and sugar is a love. I love sugar. I love to eat sweet things. And so this is not about not enjoying what you're eating. It's just about um, how to have a balanced way of eating while also enjoying the foods you love. Yeah, 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 for sure. So before we get into sugar, I'm just a little bit intrigued about the word masala, of course, because your uh, your organization is called Masala Body. And I thought it was just useful to explain to the listeners that masala is an Indian word, which means spice. And there's this little phrase, isn't there, which is sugar and spice and all things nice. So today we're not talking about spice, but we are going to talk about sugar as well. And um, certainly try and do some of the myth busting um, about sugar that's out there as well. So maybe to kick us off before we get into that, it'd be really useful to start with what sugar is. And it sounds like a really simple question, but there's so much confusion about what sugar actually is. And if you can kick us off with perhaps telling us a little bit about the metabolism of it, how do we really use this in our body as well? Oh, yes, absolutely. Well, what so what sugar does is, first of all, it has a, a very, very um, tempting, sweet taste. And, and that really is it creates a dopamine effect in our body. So it gives us that high. A lot of times we also get that high these days with our cell phone kind of going off for different notifications. It gives you that that thing that you almost can't resist, even though you try. And, um, and so with that dopamine, it's very, very instant. And it feels very just just natural when you eat something, it makes you feel good to the point that you don't even realize how good you're feeling, you just feel like you need that food. And so, so what sugar does in terms of metabolism, is that uh, it, it causes the release of insulin. And insulin, what happens when insulin is released from our body is that it takes any of the sugar or blood sugar that's in our blood and takes it out of our blood, and it stores it as fat. And so this is really key to know because you're going to actually experience this happening from an outward feeling where when you eat something sugary, it could be um, a cookie, it could be a pastry, um, you know, maybe like a half a pastry at least or a full pastry, a few cookies, you may feel what we refer to as a sugar high. And what that is, is sugar is in our blood. We're feeling that dopamine, we're feeling that energy. But very soon after, you, uh, those of you that are listening may, may, may feel this familiar feeling, you feel a sugar crash. And so what actually happened there from a biological perspective is that insulin took the sugar that was in your blood, took it out of your blood, and is now storing it as fat. And as a result, you are feeling lower, and you're, you're feeling lower energy, and you're also feeling hungry. So there's two things here that are working against metabolism. One is that sugar is being stored as fat instantly. If you don't burn it off, like within 30 minutes, not maybe not that moment, but like within 30 minutes, if you don't burn it off, meaning if you don't go and bike ride or run or walk really fast, it will get stored as fat. Secondly, you'll feel hungry and you'll actually need to eat more calories. So you end up eating double or more calories over the course of the day as this is happening. It's an appetite um, it creates appetite. Yeah. So when we're talking about metabolism, metabolism is the energy that food gives us. And it's really slowing our metabolism to consume sugar because we're, it's being stored as fat and because we are feeling hunger and we're having the tendency to eat more calories. Great. Love that explanation. It's really important, isn't it? Just so that we get those foundations right, so that we know what we're talking about when we're talking about sugar. We know what metabolism is and isn't. But I would love to take you back to what you said right at the beginning, which was about dopamine. And there's a lot of headlines out there which claim, and I say the word claim loosely, we'll chat about it, claim that sugar is addictive. 
And there's quite a bit of controversy um, around this. I don't know if you're um, familiar with the work of Robert Lustig. He wrote the book Metabolical. He's one of the um, professors at the University of California. And so he's done a lot of work around this. And the, he stated that he does believe sugar is addictive from that perspective because it has got these metabolic properties that you've just described in terms of that high and that low that create that sense of I need more. But also what you've alluded to by talking about dopamine, those more hedonic properties, which give you that sense of, I need to feel this again, the sort of dopamine rush as such, which which actually lies at the heart of our habit. So I wondered really what your perspective was when you use the word sugar is addictive or you get cravings for sugar. Are we talking about the habit here? Um, because we're not really talking about that level of addiction that you get with drugs like cocaine and heroin, are we, in terms of that degree of withdrawal that you experience with an addiction? This is very much more about that that dopamine, that that feel-good factor that we get when we eat sugar. What's, what's your views on that? Well, so there is the feel-good, but there is actually a lot of studies that show that uh, that the sugar has effects similar to, uh, to, to a drug. It creates a, an internal addiction that your your body is actually craving sugar. And so it's almost bigger than us, even because we can try to uh, we could try to control behavioral behavioral aspects. But when it comes to our body craving foods, it's bigger than we can control. It's something that you actually have to shift and change. Uh, and so, you know, there was um, recent recent, you know, uh, lots of studies that are showing that um, that it is almost similar to that of, of cocaine. Actually, in fact, there has been studies that show that uh, that mice were given um, cocaine as well as sugar and they would go back to the sugar uh, almost in the same amounts as they would go back to the cocaine. They would, they would, they would want it so much. And so the, the fact about sugar, we may even experience this in, uh, in our lives. When you have some sugar, it actually feeds your gut and your gut biome for the bacteria that are feeding on sugar. And so as a result, your gut or your body is craving more sugar because it needs it to feed on it. And, and so, uh, and so when you avoid sugar or better yet replace what you're eating with other foods that are more nutritious, uh, you don't have that same bacteria growing. In fact, you actually replace that sugar feeding bacteria with plant feeding bacteria or other types of food feeding bacteria. And so you can replace that and actually change that. Mm -hmm. And you won't feel those addictions as much as you did before. So part of this is mental, but part of it is actually physical. And that's why sugar feels so overwhelming and it can feel so powerful over, uh, over what we, we desire. Mm, mm, no, some great, great points there. And certainly I think uh, important to reflect on some of that language that we use around sugar as well, because I think and you might have experienced this as well. What I found is when you start talking about sugar being addictive, the next thing that follows is, well, then we should avoid it completely. And there's a whole cohort of people who are, I'm going sugar-free. I'm doing a 30-day sugar-free challenge. I was just off on a call um, with someone who's, who's just done that. And, and this sense that we need to completely avoid it then, of course, becomes even more difficult and becomes something that becomes unsustainable. Um, so I love what you've just said about it's not about totally avoiding sugar. It's understanding what it's doing for your metabolism, but talking about swaps what else can you do that's more comfortable that's more sustainable that's more helpful for you so talk to us about that in terms of this idea of swapping sugar or thinking about more of what you need rather than thinking less of what you don't Absolutely. And that's exactly what it is, um, is, is instead of, uh, instead of thinking about taking it out and, and, and only getting off sugar, you also want to have that, uh, have that conversation about what to swap those things that you love with what to add back into your diet, because otherwise you it's very, very common to try to take foods out that are that are known to have sugar, but then we just actually crave them more. Um, there's also some studies that show that anytime a food is forbidden, it makes us want it more. And then also what we were talking about about our actual bodies physically craving it will make your body cry out for it even more to the point that you 
often, often people may go and binge on sugar when they take it out of their diet. So it's really important to look at this as a swap or as an ad. Um, and part of, you know, what you were mentioning before about masala, um, one of the things that I found very powerful when I lost 40 pounds um, was that I started adding spices to my diet. And, um, and I had always added spices being of Indian origin, but now I started combining it with uh, wholesome, healthy, nutritious foods all the time. And what happens with spices is that it actually lights up those centers of your brain um, that give you that give you satisfaction from what you're eating, similar to what sugar does, similar. And so it actually is is creating that satisfaction. And so you feel satiated and you feel like you have what you need. And so ironically, those spices are usually thought of as spicy and almost opposite than sugar. Um, they are a great first step to replacing sugar. And I want to note that you actually do not have to have spicy spices. In fact, one of the best places to start is with a sweet spice, one that we all know very well, cinnamon. Mm -hmm. And if you were to start adding cinnamon, for example, into your coffee, this is the first thing I did before I lost 40 pounds or 18 kilos, uh, is that I started adding uh, spices of cinnamon, sweet cinnamon into my coffee. And in the beginning, I used to use artificial sweeteners. Uh, I thought they were healthier for me. We can talk about that as well, mm -hmm. but I thought they were healthier for me. So now I started bringing down the artificial sweeteners, having less of it and having more cinnamon. And over time, I was able to completely take those sweeteners out. And now I only use cinnamon in my coffee and it is extremely fulfilling. It's extremely natural. And it feels really great because it's actually scientifically proven to balance your blood sugar and to keep your blood sugar sugar lower or at a really good place so that you're not storing that fat that we were talking about earlier. Um, yeah. So, so swapping cinnamon in is a really great way to get started. Um, and then also looking at, at other swaps of, of, how can you replace anything that comes in a package with, um, with, with something that's real in a whole food. And so, you know, as I'm sharing this, I want to dispel a myth, which is that sugar is mainly in sweets. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times if we're feeling that we want to take sugar out, it's easy to say, okay, I'm not going to eat that dessert. I'm not going to eat the chocolate cake. Um, and, and that's a great, you know, that that's a great start as long as you have something nice to replace it with like a cinnamon tea, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but it, but the, the myth here is that sugar is actually in so many of the foods that are not sweet that we eat because they quickly break down to sugar. Um, so a carbohydrate is sugar and, and it's, it's just a molecule of sugar. And so if you were to look at carbs that are, that are burning quickly, um, for example, things like granola bars protein bars that come in packages that seem healthy. Um, uh, many, uh, many breads that are that don't have fiber in it, what's going to happen is they're going to quickly break down to sugar, and they're going to have that same effect on your metabolism that we talked about before. Mm -hmm. And so really starting with replacing your meals and making sure that your meals are not quickly breaking down to sugar is the key way to actually have your body get off of that addictive desire for sugar. I think it's also important to understand that sugar comes in many guises. And when you look at the back of a food label, and it could say fructose or sucrose or something else, but to recognize those names um, for sugar as well um, is so important. But I want to take you back to an experience that I've had, which uh, what you said is so helpful, actually, because um, in my attempt to reduce uh, my sugar intake as well, one of the key places that I found that I needed sugar was in my tea, uh, just like you with your with your coffee. And, and uh, there was just no way I could get down from two spoons of sugar to one spoon to half spoon you know they say try that that'll work and it wasn't my tea wasn't fun I wasn't enjoying it so my way of stopping sugar was to stop having tea I completely stopped having tea and that's been the only way that I've been able to stop having sugar in my tea so um it's really interesting that thinking about alternative ways you don't have to give up something that you completely love because of the sugar in it, you can think about swapping uh, that in and out, which is a, a really much more helpful way of carrying on with something that you do enjoy. And that's helpful for you, but try it in a different way. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's so true. So yeah, sometimes you do, you might just have to take something out if the relationship is too close um, for you. So like the sugar and tea. Um, 
Now, you know, a couple other swaps to consider are things like um, I was talking about granola bars, which sound healthy a lot. I mean, and then they are healthier than cookies and they are healthier than than potato chips. But, you know, if you look at the back of a granola bar, if you look at the back of any processed food, a way to quickly identify if there's sugar, even with a different name, is really just to look at the sugar content. And instead of focusing on the calories, which a lot of people do, they'll look at the calories as a source of should I eat this or not? Well, we need calories. And so it's more about looking are looking at are these calories nutritious? Are they dense with with the things that I need that are going to help my body? And so when you my eye whenever I'm looking at a, a nutrition label always goes to the sugar content. And I always make sure that it's at least preferably five grams or less per serving seven grams is a stretch that you could do if you you know, if you're if you're starting. Mm -hmm. Um, So seven grams or less. And, and, and then that's really a way to see, is my blood sugar going to be elevated? Am I going to um, store fat? Am I going to slow down my metabolism? It's all from the sugar. And that's the number one thing that I recommend looking at if you're looking at boosting your metabolism. Um, so for something like a granola bar, you could instead replace it with nuts, with almonds, with seeds like pumpkin seeds or sunflower seeds, um, and, and have about two tablespoons of either of those because they are um, healthy fats, which are dense in calories. And so you want to just have the right amount. Um, so having, uh, you know, swapping that for something like that. And if you wanted to add in a little bit of dried fruit to give you that sweetness, you could, but it's important that you always are going to pair any kind of fruit that you have, whether it's dried fruit or an apple, um, or, or any kind of other fruit with a healthy fat or a healthy or, or a healthy protein, because it actually slows the, the, uh, increase of your blood sugar when you're pairing foods together like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you won't get the fat storage that you would if you were eating it on your own. I say if you were to have a granola bar or a protein bar, because many of us are busy and we need something to grab and take with us, mm-hmm. definitely have it with something else that's not going to elevate your blood sugar. So have it with, um, you know, if you're able to have it on the side of cottage cheese, if you eat cottage cheese or Greek yogurt, or if you're going to have it on the side of chicken or fish or tofu, because those are proteins that are stabilizing your blood sugar. Mm -hmm. And then you may not need to have the entire bar have half of it. And so you can use portions as another lever along with combining sugary foods with healthy fats or proteins to really keep your blood sugar low while enjoying it as well. No, great, um, great tips. I did want to take you back though to, um, sugars per se, because there's also a conversation that happens around artificial sugars. And often, again, what I find is that when people are trying to reduce their sugar intake, what they do is they replace them with other forms of sugar and artificial sweeteners and aspartame and even honey. Um, So what are your views on that? Is one sugar better than another sugar in that in that regard? What do you think about artificial sweeteners? Yes, absolutely. There, there are ones that are better. There are um, sugars and artificial sweeteners that are going to help you more than others. And so just overall, starting off artificial sweeteners, because they have no calories, seem like they're a healthier option, often something that that people that are looking to lose weight will go to. Um, But what's happening is that even though you are not necessarily spiking your insulin, even though you're not ingesting calories, what's happening with artificial sweeteners is that your brain is still uh, being addicted to the taste of sweet. Mm -hmm. And so your body is desiring that taste of sweet. And, um, there was an article, um, that was, that was recently shared, um, that was really about, um, and and this was in uh, science daily. Um, and it was around artificial sweeteners, increasing appetite. And the reason for this is because when your body, uh, uh, when your brain uh, feels the sugar, uh, it actually thinks that there's going to be energy associated with it. So it thinks that there's going to be calories associated with it when it when it when it uh, has that taste of sweet. But what's happening is that you're not giving your body any energy with it because there's no calories with this with this type of um, artificial with any artificial sweeteners. And so your body's crying out for calories. So it makes you actually 
hungrier. And, and, you know, many of you may start to see these, see this relationship and, and we think it's natural that we're so hungry. I talk to many women that feel like their appetite is just never done. They're never satisfied. And it's because of your, the fact that you're feeding your body foods that are causing you to want more foods in different ways. Yeah. Um, so in general, uh, um, aspartame, you know, many, many sweeteners, artificial sweeteners are not, um, are not healthy, including the one that you mentioned, honey, um, which honey is okay. I mean, it's okay, but it is actually, it, it, it does have calories associated with it. So it's not necessarily causing more appetite in the same way artificial sweeteners do, but it is elevating your blood sugar. So it is causing that fat storage. What I recommend is if you want honey, have a little bit because it's not about completely taking things out that will really cause binging. Um, but what you could do is you could start looking at other ideas. Uh, and, and one suggestion that's, that's scientifically proven is to use monk fruit. And so monk fruit can come in a powdery form that looks just like sugar, or it can come in a liquid form. And uh, monk fruit is actually one of the sweeteners. It's not artificial, it's, 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 it's real, mm -hmm. and it keeps your blood sugar the same. It doesn't move it up or down. Now, the, the one that is, um, that is even better is cinnamon that I talked about because it actually lowers your blood sugar. Um, but if you're, if you're feeling the need for a little bit more sweet, then having that monk fruit or any other natural sweetener um, is much better. Yeah, yeah, no, great. And I love the, the cinnamon conversation because it's also got additional properties. Don't forget spices. It's not just about the sort of the, the sugar effect. It's that they've got their own incredible properties as well, don't they? So cinnamon certainly is anti-inflammatory and it's got very high antioxidant properties as well. And all of this, of course, is added benefit that you're getting that you're not getting from sugar as well. So amazing. Look, I think this is a topic that could roll and roll. There's so many uh, areas that we could really do a much deeper dive in. But Let's try and sum up. You've shared so much with us already. So give us those three big tips for, for listeners today who's saying, I'm craving sugar. How can I get rid of these cravings? Now, here is your lifestyle first prescription. Your three activating actions to take you from knowing to doing. Okay, absolutely. So the first thing, and, and I, I love to share things that are actionable. Um, there's bigger takeaways, you know, by, by listening to what we've talked about again. Um, there, but, but actually, the, the key thing is to get started. And the, the thing that you can do first is to change your mindset from um, changing from thinking about taking out sugar to thinking about what can I add to my diet that will satiate me, that will keep me full, that I love. Um, one example to get started with is to add cinnamon to your coffee or to your tea or to your smoothie if you don't have um, ca uh, caffeine or on top of your fruit. Those are all kind of natural ways that they can blend in. Um, so adding that. Um, number two, another thing that you can do is that you can um, start to start to do what, what one of my mantras is, which is called protein more. And this is really key for, for getting off of sugar is adding more protein to your diet, adding it to your breakfast, adding it to your lunch, adding it to a snack and or to dinner. Uh, because what protein does is that it creates a, a, a satiety where, uh, and it also digests very slowly. So you actually feel satisfied and you feel full. Um, I have many uh, uh, women that I've worked with in the past that they would go to work and there would be donuts or croissants at their break room. That actually happened for me when I was when I was working in a professional office as well. And it's almost impossible to resist when you're stressed and you're busy and you don't have time. But when you start adding protein to your diet, you could be someone could put a a, a box of pastries in front of you and you don't even want it anymore. It's that powerful to have that protein. So it's very realistic to do that. Um, so protein more. And then the third piece, um, the third thing that you can do, which is really an easy way to get started with, um, with getting off sugar is to do what I uh, drink, what I call de bloating water. And so de bloating water, it has, uh, and like I said, these are very actionable things that you can do that will really help you get going right away. So de bloating water is a pitcher of water, about six cups or so of water, but it could be any amount that your pitcher fills. Um, you add one to two lemons in it 
which is detoxifying. It cleanses your body. Um, you add uh, one cucumber that you slice to it, which is de-bloating because it's full of water. So it's hydrating your body and cleansing your body even more. Uh, and then you add mint. You add about 10 to 12 leaves of mint. And mint, the scent of mint actually helps you uh, curb your sugar cravings and also curb your appetite. So you combine this in the water, infuse it overnight, meaning simply put it in the fridge overnight. And when you get it out the next morning, first of all, it, you feel like you're in a spa. So this is not about, you know, being in pain for getting off sugar or hating it. You're almost like, wow, this is amazing. And this is part of the transformation is to love what you're doing. Um, so you feel really amazing about this water, you drink it and actually your cravings you will feel will go away immediately. And I recommend drinking this glass of water in the morning. And you could drink it along the day, you know, throughout the day if you'd like to, but at least having one glass in the morning, then having that cinnamon somewhere in your morning as well. And then thinking about protein more. The these three things are really going to get you far into getting off sugar in a way that is more abundant and more positive and very sustainable. Oh, I love that. Love, love, love that. You know what I'm going to be doing tonight, don't you? Lemon, cucumber <laughs> and mint. That picture is in the fridge ready for the morning. So thank you for that. That was incredible. Now, look, I'm sure there's people listening who have been fascinated by what you've been talking about, are ready to embark on their own weight loss journey or sugar less protein more journey. So tell us what's the best way to find you, reach out to you. Oh my gosh, absolutely. Well, I'm so excited to share um, that I have a free gift that I'd like to share um, for your audience. And this is my sweet spice uh, PDF. It's a sweet spice cheat sheet. And I talk about this sweet spice that is most likely in your kitchen cabinet. It helps to lower blood sugar and curb sugar cravings. Uh, and the cheat sheet includes three health benefits of using the spice, five ways to use it in your day, and an easy fire tea recipe, which is a belly fat burning tea recipe um, that you can have at night. And it's very great for your sleep as well. Well, it doesn't have caffeine in it that uses the sweet spice. Uh, and so you can grab this and then you'll be in touch with me as well after that at masalabody.com forward slash sweet spice PDF. So masalabody.com forward slash sweet spice PDF. And then um, masalabody.com is where I have so much content. A lot of the things we talked about with scientific references, um, more information, more in-depth uh, um, articles. That's a really great way to, to keep in touch with me. Um, and you'll, you'll automatically be on my newsletter when you sign up for the, the sweet spice cheat sheet. So I look forward to, to seeing you grab that. Oh, that's great. It's a really great way to get connected with you. And that cheat sheet <laughs> sounds fabulous. So amazing. Thank you so much for that lovely gift for the for the listeners today. And it really has been an incredible pleasure speaking with you today as well. So that leaves me to wish everyone listening a happy, healthy day. Thanks for joining us on the Lifestyle First podcast, making self-care as easy as one, two, three. Don't forget to subscribe and share. And we'd love it if you'd be kind enough to leave a review. To learn more or to arrange a consultation, please visit www.dralkapatel.com. See you next time.